Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 131 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron. Super thrilled that you're here today. Um, Today, I have no guest to interview, but I have been so inspired by this class that I've been teaching, the 90 Days to Done, um, in which people wrote their books in 90 days that I kind of want to just share with you how they did it. I am a big believer in writing fast. So I'm going to kind of talk through um, a class that I often teach. Um, I do this at Stanford in a six hour format. I've done it in a one hour format. I do it in a 90 day format in 90 days to done. And now I'm going to do it in about 20 minutes. So sit back, kick up your heels, maybe grab a piece of paper um, to jot some ideas down. This is how I do it. This is how I teach to do it. Um, Hopefully something in what I say will spark your brain and get you to write and fast and get you to finishing your books if you're not doing that already. If you are doing that already, congratulations and listen along in case I give you some new tips. So I am a huge believer in writing quickly. I do not believe that writing more slowly produces good books or better books. It does produce good books, of course, but it doesn't produce better books than you would produce if you were writing quickly. In fact, it's the opposite. The longer we take to write a book, sometimes if we've taken two, three, five, ten years to write a book, that means that during that process, we were all kinds of different people. Like, especially if you've taken more than a year to write a book, you have changed in that time. If you take three months to write a book, you are the person who is writing this book to the best of your ability at that time. You have the ability to hold on to all the concepts and the overarching themes. You don't forget them because you have put the book away for a month or for a couple of weeks. Uh, You're holding all the plot threads together a lot stronger, more strongly. So, I have this theory that faster written books are more cohesively structured and a little bit more emotionally impactful. I have seen that in my own writing, so it's apocryphal. I've seen it in friends' writing. Um, I've seen it in big name writers' writing. Uh, Grapes of Wrath, which is an enormous book and a genius book, uh, was written in 90 days. Um, Stephen King writes all of his drafts in 90 days and you could be saying, oh God, I don't want to do that. Or you could be saying, oh God, I love his books. He does that in three months. He writes his first draft in three months. I just kind of think that 90 days is an ideal amount of time to write a book. Um, Could it be six months? Sure. Could it be four months? Absolutely. Could it be two months? Yes. It's about doing the math. I really like 90 days though. It, um, it's kind of like an extended NaNoWriMo. NaNoWriMo is intense. Uh, And it's difficult to get a whole book into a month, believe me. I know most of us in NaNoWriMo, which is National Novel Writing Month, if you don't know about it, it's in November. Um, Most of us write a pretty undone first draft in those first 50,000 words in the month of November. But with three of those back to back, with more breathing room, you don't have to write 1,667 words a day like you do in November. Um, You have this time to kind of expand into. And... Why should we write fast? Why should we write all the way to the end, which was what I really believe that writers should do? Okay, first of all, I just need to tell you that everything I'm going to tell you right now is right. I know that I am correct. You should listen. Second of all, I know that everything I'm saying to you might not be useful to you, in which case, throw it out. Third of all, don't trust anybody who tells you that they know the right answers in writing. Nobody knows all the right answers. Uh, Every single writer who teaches writing has things that work for them. I'm going to tell you the things that work for me and for my students. If these do not work for you, throw them out. But I would like to posit that if you are a person who does not fast draft your way all all the way to the end of a book, Um, you should think about trying to do that in the NaNoWriMo method, which simply means to write fast and badly in order to get a book done, in order to have a book to revise. I can hear the perfectionists screaming right now in your cars or in your, at your kitchen table, wherever you are right now. You say to me, I have to write my book 
and revise as I go along. I can't move on to chapter three until I know chapters one and two are as perfect as I can make them. It just makes me crazy. I can't write forward if I, if the stuff that came before it isn't perfect. Fine. You may have heard me say this before. If you've taken any of my classes, I may have said it on this podcast. Um, I believe that is only your actual method if you are revising as you go along and, and this and has to be there, and you are completing books that you are happy with. If you are just one of the many, 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 many people who believe that they have to revise as they go, but you don't finish books, then that is not your method. It's simply not your method. You have convinced yourself that that is your method, but it is not. In all of my time of writing, I have met two people. One is Carolyn Jewell, a friend of mine. She revises as she goes. When she types the end, she sends the damn book to her editor, uh, which is incredible. Um, and another person was a person that I interviewed on this show who does it that way. And I can't remember who it was. Um, but those are the two people I have ever known who do it that way consistently. All of the rest of us write crappy first drafts of, of some sort or another, and then we go back and revise. So do open your mind to the fact that if you think that you need to revise as you go, you probably don't. You're probably in the vast majority of us, the 99.9% of us who have to write a, a first draft first, get to the end, even though it is a horrible, horrible mess, and then go back and clean it up. And revision is the best part, uh, but we're not talking about revision today. Um, the other thing that I want to say is about this whole writing badly thing. I don't know about you, but I just realized this about myself recently really recently, within the last few months, that I tell everybody they must write a terrible book. I tell everybody that they must write crap, absolute dreck, stuff that you would be humiliated if anybody ever looked at your computer and found because it is so badly written. um, The ideas are not cohesive. The characters don't make any sense. You forget everything that you ever meant to do plot-wise. It's just ugly and actually terrible. Not Like, I feel like it's terrible, but it's actually good, but it's actually terrible. Um, I tell everyone that, and in the back of my mind, my whole entire adult writing life, I have hoped that I'll be the exception. I understand that everybody has to write a bad first draft, but when I do it, when I look at my pages and see how bad they are on that first draft, it makes me feel shame, which is something I'm really trying to get over. Now that I can identify it and see it, I understand that I have shame about this, and I understand that it is ridiculous. I am also writing shitty first drafts. That's what we have to do. Um, And so I'm just saying that in case you're one of those people who think, well, everybody else writes a shitty first draft, but I really want this to get this right. I can't bear to put all of that crap on the page and let it sit there. I can't bear it. I can't bear it. Yes, you can bear it. We have to bear it. That's how we get to the ends of books in order to revise them. Also, do not wait until you get better at writing to write the book of your heart. You're not going to get better unless you write the book of your heart. Don't wait. I think I did that for a long time. I was trying to wait until I knew I could do it. I still don't know that. 24 books later, I still don't know that, and I still just write them. Along the same lines, uh, Jay Thorne and I talked about this on our podcast, The Writer's Well, last week. Um, Don't save any ideas. Don't hold back your biggest, best idea for when you are better, for after you've written a couple of books. Um, As Annie Dillard says in The Writing Life, you want to spend it all, play it all. The reason for that is when you play your best ideas on the page, when you put them down and catch them, new ideas that are better, even better than the best idea you ever had, will backfill and spring up to meet you for the next book. It's insane that that happens and it always does. And it's a really human, uh, natural thing to do to want to save your good ideas for when you're really, really good at writing. But I promise you, you'll have better ideas, but you can only have better ideas if you get rid of those really good ideas now by writing them out. Um, Another thing, if you're writing fast, so think about your time. I, my students in the 90 days class, we take about two weeks to plot and plan and think about the structure of our books and then we leap in. So that's about 10 weeks to write. I don't write on the weekends. Um, I choose not to. Writing is my full-time job, but I will tell you, I don't write any more books 
because it's my full-time job, I just do other things. Um, I write exactly the same amount of books now as I did when I worked a job, which was always 56 hours a week and usually more like 80 hours a week. I'm not writing any extra books. Um, I take the weekends off. I write five days a week. If you're writing an 80,000 word book, say, and you've got 10 weeks to do it in and you don't write on the weekends, you just write before work, 45 minutes or so, an hour, um, you only need to write 1,600 words a day to finish a book with taking the weekends off. If you want to write every day in those 10 weeks, that's only about 1,100 words a day. These are really, really doable numbers, especially if you're just writing crap to get to the end of a book, which is what we're all trying to do. These are doable, gettable numbers. These are absolutely doable. And the reason I say this, the reason I'm doing this podcast is because as I record, it's the 17th of May, um, three and possibly four out of the 11 people who are in the 90 days to done class are done. They ended two, they finished their books two weeks early. They did their calendars. They plotted out what days they could write and what days they couldn't write. They did the math. They knew how much they had to write and they just sat down and wrote and books are done. The first draft of a book for them is done and the other ones in the class are, are quickly closing in. They're all finishing their books. It is amazing that this can happen. I'm always amazed when I do it myself and I'm even, I'm even happier when I see other people doing it. So, but the thing that um, you use those first two weeks or what, however long you wanna do it, but don't take more than two weeks. I honestly usually do this kind of plotting in a day because I am more of a pantser. I like to know some big points about my book and then I hurdle myself towards those big points, um, but I'm pantsing most of the way. Uh, the thing that you need to do during that time when you're plotting this book is just to understand story structure. It doesn't matter what kind of story structure you resonate with. Um, there's the hero's journey. There's the three act, uh, Aristotelian structure, which I can never say, but I just said it. That's amazing. And, um, let's see what else there's story grid structure, which damn, there's a lot to know in there. So that kind of overwhelms me. I do love it, but I don't use it. Um, for me, the thing that broke story structure apart in my head is the book I always recommend called Story Engineering by Larry Brooks. Story Engineering by Larry Brooks. When I read it, I finally understood what the three-act structure was trying to do because, uh, you know, I have a master's in writing and I never knew what the three-act structure was because the three-act structure is act one, beginning, act two, what the hell is happening here? It's too long. I don't know what to do. And act three, resolution. I did not know what to do in that huge act two. Larry, Bra Larry Brooks breaks up act two into two acts. So he talks about the four act structure, which if you've ever taken a class with me, this is what I use four act structure because each act has to do something completely different. Um, and just very briefly, just to tell you how Larry Brooks structures it and how I structure my books, um, this is going to be the two minute overview of story structure. You have a hook to get the reader into the book. And a quick aside here to say we all use different terms to talk about the same damn things. The same damn things are happening at the same time in story structure, but one person may call it a hook or something else and other people call it other things. So if you've been confused about that, that is why. So the hook gets you into the book, something interesting that happens. Then we use the first act to show our hero in status quo, um, what their lives look like, as it is today, at the end of Act One, we have an inciting incident that plunges our hero of any gender into a new world, into a new problem that they didn't know that they would have to face. That's at about the yeah, 18 to 25 percent mark is where of the book is where that inciting incident comes in. Right around the 50 percent mark we get a context shifting midpoint where what the hero thought they wanted is actually not what they wanted. It's even bigger or harder or better or worse. Something changes. The example I always use um, is super simple and trite, but it works for me, is that at the inciting incident, perhaps our um, wife found lipstick on the collar of her husband's shirt. That's what plunges her into trying to figure out, is this marriage what she thought it was? Is she who th she thought she was, which is much more interesting. At the 50% mark, perhaps she discovers that the color 
of the lipstick that she found on her husband's shirt is actually the shade her sister wears. So now we are not dealing with a story about a woman coming to terms with her marriage and trying to figure out what to do about it. This is a woman now who can't trust anyone around her, who doesn't have the family system that she thought she did. That just made it bigger, harder, worse, right? So something always happens around the context shifting midpoint. Um, this can be oh, oftentimes death. If you have a large death in a book, death is a very good thing to put in the 50% mark because you can never be the same after it happens. Same thing with sex. If um, your characters are going to have sex, 50% mark is fantastic. They are different people afterwards to each other than they were in the moments before. So um, there's your 50% context shifting midpoint at about the 75 to 80 percent mark we have the dark moment where all is lost um everything is gone this character has not gotten what they wanted and their lives are falling apart it can be very very small and subtle and quiet or it can be very very big and the plane has gone down you know um actually that's not a good example the plane probably went down at the inciting incident. But uh, in the dark moment, everything is lost. Everything that they wanted is gone. And then act four, the cleanup is the resolution. It's the final fight scene. It's the final chase scene. It's how our characters figure out how to get what they want, which is not what they thought they wanted. Um, so I have those points in mind. I have the hook. I have the inciting incident. I have the context shifting midpoint. And I have the dark moment generally in mind. I do a couple other things. I do some pinch points. I'm not going to get into those here. Read Larry Brooks story engineering if you want the extra stuff. Um, but that's all I have in mind before I start working. The thing that I need to do at that point after I've got these points is um, I work on characters. We're not going to go into character building here, but you want your characters to be three-dimensional. You want them to have an internal goal that only you know about, your character doesn't know about, but this is the way their character arc is going to change over the course of the book. And you want them to have an external goal, which is what they're fighting for, which is kind of married to and combined with their interior goal that you have for them. Um, I kind of work those out so I know what my characters are going to be doing and how they're going to be changing in the book. And then I just start writing. The important thing is to find your time to write when you are going to write and commit to it. What I really like doing is um, printing out blank calendars on eight and a half by 11 paper. And I X out all the days I can't write. Not only are those the weekends, but they're the times that I'm traveling. I always tell myself I'll write when I travel. I never do. I have to get rid of those. Um, they're the days when some kind of party is happening, when I'm teaching. Um, it always turns out that I have a lot fewer days to actually get my writing done than I think I do. And then I do some reverse math. I know where I want to end up. I know when I want to end up. And I do the math to see how many words I need to do. I know by um, process of just doing this job how much I can write in an hour and therefore I know how many hours per writing day I need to put into writing. I also recommend that you read Cal Newport's book, Deep Work, if you haven't already, Deep Work by Cal Newport. It's kind of about, um, it's not kind of about, it is completely about finding the time where you can go distraction free and do your creative task. It doesn't take a long time. Even masters at their craft, we're talking um, the Picassos and the Churchills, the people who are the best at their job can't do creation for more. They can't sustain the deep work creation for more than three to four hours. Um, four hours is kind of where human beings tap out. You can keep working all day, but you should be doing other tasks. Um, I am a full-time writer and I def I generally do either first drafting or revision for about two to three hours a day. That's all I do. Um, and that's me as a full-time writer, two or three hours. But when I was working those 60 to 80 hours a week, I would just write 45 minutes a day. And I got book after book after book after book written in 45 minutes a day. Um, and yes, I would get up at 4 a.m. to catch those 45 minutes before I had to get in the shower at 4.45. So there are some sacrifices that you may have to make in, during these 90 days if you want to bring this book of your heart to fruition. So you find that time in your day. You might be sleeping a little bit less for a while, but it's just 90 days. You can do it. Um, for deep work, though, you have to go distraction-free. And that includes anything bonking onto your computer, those little messages. It includes your cell phone making any kind of noise. Turn that shit off. 
put it away. Just make it go silent. I usually go into airplane mode on my computer. I turn the wireless off so nothing can get me. Um, you never need to do research while you're writing ever, 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 ever. When you're doing first draft writing, every time you think you need to do research, put in an asterisk, pretend that you got the answer and keep writing. You could do that this afternoon or tonight when your brain is too tired to create, but still wants to be in the story. Do that kind of research then after you've written your words for the day. Um, every single time your phone gives that little ding that says you have a message of some sort, it, it, um, it lights up the part, the receptor in our brain. I can't remember the exact name for it, but, uh, um, the part of our brain that reacts when we hear a branch break in the forest the part of our brain that makes us think there is a predator. It is almost impossible not to look at your phone when you hear that ding because our brain still, you know, a million years later says, that's a predator, you must look, you might be in danger. So um, the fact that you can't turn that off in your brain is not you not having enough willpower. It is merely a part of you being human. So don't feel bad for it, just make it be silent. If this is an emergency, tell the people who need to get hold of you an emergency. Switch to your phone to that, uh, I think all phones have it, that you can set it up. If someone calls twice in a row in a certain number of time, uh, minutes, it'll ring through. Tell your kids, I'm on silent. You can't text me. But if it's an emergency, ring twice and it will ring through. Do something like that if, um, if you just can't go all the way away in, t in case of emergency. But you have to go distraction-free. Uh, it really, really helps to put yourself in a physical place that is different from where you do all your other work or any other work. If you answer email at, uh, while you're on the couch, don't write on the couch. Or if you do write on the couch, switch your body to the opposite side of the couch. Something as small as that can make a real, real big difference. If there's a chair you never sit in at the dining room table and you can't leave the house to write, sit in that chair only to write. Do not look at email. Do not look at Facebook. Do not look at anything. Um, sit in that chair and just do your writing. The brain adapts and it starts to pre-plan. I mean, we can go into a lot of things like, you know, sense, uh, Light a particular scented candle every time you write. And then, late, you know, pretty soon when you light that candle, your brain associates that with writing and it slips into the writing mode a little bit easier. Um, a lot of people use the same kind of soundtrack. I always use a white noise uh, with a 45 minute ticker. So it's like doing a grandfather clock tick while I'm doing my 45 minutes because I still write in 45 minute blocks. And when the clock stops ticking, I know, oh, I can now check email. Um, but my brain knows when the white noise is going and I can hear the ticking, I am writing. I'm not doing anything else, nothing else. And in that way, you're getting the work done. And that's the whole point of this whole thing that I'm trying to tell you is that you are the only one who's going to have to change to get your work done. You may be listening to this and you may be saying, Rachel, I get my damn work done. I produce books. Um, I'm happy with where I am. And in that case, I congratulate you and I'm really, really proud of you. But if you're like the many who might be listening to this, who are frustrated about not getting their work done and you're waiting to figure out how to get your work done, you have to sit down and figure it out. No one else will do this for you. Um, in my class, I kind of hold their hands, which makes it a little bit easier. Accountability makes things easier. If you're not part of a writer's group of any kind, go to one, go to a meetup, not to do your writing at the meetup. Who cares about that? The reason you go to meetups or any kind of writing organization is to meet people with whom you have things in common. You speak the same heart language. Like when they talk, you understand them. And when you talk, they understand you. Those are the people you're looking for. Not as critique partners. I barely believe in critique partners. I think that they can do harm sometimes. They can also help. But what you're looking for is an accountability partner. Somebody who you can email every single day and say, I got 1,700 words today. Or say, I only got 1,200 and here's why and here's how I'm going to make it up because I, I've done the math. I know I need to do 1,700 words a day. That's what you're looking for. You need that accountability. Well, I guess you don't need it. There are some people who do not need that. Um, I am a person who really, really likes accountability. Right now I'm doing a marketing accountability with a very close friend. I'm a bad marketer. I 
don't do it well. And I'm not doing ads. I just hate doing, you know, Facebook ads and AMS ads. So I and a friend are just going hard at it. And she emails me what she's done. And I need to email her every day what I've done. And for that reason, I get it done. I am accountable. So if that helps, do that. Um, But again, if you want to be a person who writes books or even just one book, if you want to be that person, no one's ever going to help you the way that you have to help yourself to get the work done. You have to take it seriously. You have to sit down. You have to commit. Um, If you're a person who has a hard time starting a book because you can't decide which one to start, uh, well, look at that. You might have spent a whole year not starting a book because you couldn't decide what to start. Whereas if you picked one, just picked one, any idea, arbitrarily, you'd be done with the first draft in three months. And then you could start writing another one or you could start revising that one. Um, You have choices when you're doing the work. It is hard to restrict yourself to one choice. um, And it always means that you're leaving good choices behind. It always means that you're making the right decision in some ways. And it always means that you're making the wrong decision in some ways. And we just kind of have to accept that. If you can't figure out how to end a book, Eventually, you have to pick away. And by picking away, you are necessarily leaving all the other ways out. Yes, that hurts. Uh, But it's just the way it works. And it's just the way books get done. And it's just the way you use up these ideas and better ones fill in behind it. I want you to have that feeling. So I hope that some of the stuff that I've talked about today is helpful. Um, Please go over to How Do You Write dot net and let me know leave a comment tell me what you're struggling with Um, it's just a joy to talk with you guys today and I'm gonna leave it at that just my voice telling you to write a book in 90 days Um, please do it if you want to get on the waiting list for the next class uh, which doesn't happen for another three and a half months you can always shoot me shoot me an email at rachel at rachelheron.com spelled funny look it up Um, Or leave me a comment over at howdoyouwrite.net. But that's not what this is about. This is about you deciding to do your work and to finish your book. You can do it. I know you can. Please let me know how it goes. And happy writing to you.